So guys, as a way of introduction, I want to give you a quick, brief introduction to the entire series first. We're, we entitled it Cutting Through the Darkness, Being Christ's Witness When It's Hard. The fact is, is if you've heard it many, many times, it's just, it seems to be more and more, even today, that the world seems to be getting darker. Uh, there are things that are happening now that we would never have dreamed would be uh, a reality uh, 20 years ago. And yet it seems that that's happening. And there's a lot of people who will blame different, different people, universities, Hollywood, politicians, whatever the case is. I can tell you without a question that the, the reason why things are getting darker, it is actually not the world's fault. It just isn't. The fact is, is from the very beginning of Adam and Eve, ever since Adam sinned from their children, Cain and Abel, we have seen a reality, and that is that there is sin in this world, and sinners do what sinners do, and that is sin. Now, they'll find all kinds of clever ways and more efficient ways to sin, but at the end of the day, that's what they're doing. They're sinning. It just comes naturally to them. But it does seem to be like it's getting a bit darker. And so the responsibility, though, for this growing darkness, I contend, is not really on the world. It's not on the government. It's not on the schools, not Hollywood, and it's not your liberal neighbor. The fact is, if the world is getting dark, it's because the light of Christ is getting dimmer. Jesus said that we are his light into this world. And it is a scientific fact that darkness will, uh, that the darkness will overwhelm the space where light is absent. But it is also a scientific fact that darkness cannot overcome light. Now, as a brief little illustration for this, I want to do something right quick. Now, don't be alarmed. I want to let you know. Uh, I would stay still if you're standing because I'm going to shut down all the lights. I'm going to show you this brief illustration uh, right here for just this moment. This little candle it's just a little string and a ball of wax. And in this large auditorium, and even though it's not completely and absolutely dark in this auditorium, how many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you can see this light, this little candle? It's just a small, maybe an inch long flame off of this little candle. And the truth of the matter is, if we were to make this utterly dark in here where there was absolutely no light whatsoever, this little candle that you can see would actually be more visible. Because while darkness, the truth of the matter is, is darkness cannot overcome light. Quite the opposite. The darkness is always affected by even the smallest flame of light. Okay, you can turn the lights back on. When I was, I was several years ago, I went to Kenya. One of the most remarkable things I'd ever seen in the natural world. I was outside in the yard of this orphanage where I was staying. And in the bush of Kenya, there are no street lights. There was nowhere near a city. It was absolutely dark at night. The only light in the entire complex was one 60-watt incandescent bulb in the middle of the hut that I was staying in. That's the only light in the entire complex. So I walked outside with my flashlight, and I looked up, and I turned the flashlight off, and it looked like I was in a planetarium. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. All the stars all the way around me, it was absolutely amazing. And as I was just looking up, gazing at the stars, I noticed a star that was moving. Now, this wasn't a shooting star. It had no tail. It wasn't going very fast. It was a very, very slow, steady movement across the sky. I had never seen that before in my life. I had no idea what I was looking at. Finally, I asked the missionary that I was with, I tried my best to point it out. Finally, when he saw it, he said, oh, that's a satellite. I could literally see the light of a satellite orbiting the earth from where I was standing on the earth. 
when it is absolutely dark, even the most dark places, the darkest of places, the fact is, the, the darker it is, the more you can notice the light. And that's essentially what we want to look at this evening. The fact is, is that it, no matter how dark it is, no matter how vast this darkness is, light always wins. Now, we're going to be visiting over the next four nights, four weeks, four of the darkest of places. Some of the places that are quite relevant in America right now. And that is simply, it's going to be uh, the things like in dealing with government as in tonight. We're going to be dealing with the whole idea of the woke world, uh, the woke culture. We're going to be dealing with gender uh, confusion. And we're going to be dealing with something that hits home to most of you. How do you live as a Christian, a believer, bringing the gospel to your secular workplace? These are the things we're going to be looking at. These are dark places. And the truth of the matter is, is no matter how dark, no matter how vast that darkness is, that light that you have is going to penetrate that darkness. We want to help equip you to be able to do that. Now, by the way, if there's anybody who did not get notes, if you'll please raise your hand, and Clyde will be happy to come by and give you some. So that's what we're going to look at during this time. Now, at the beginning, we're going to actually begin with church and state. We're going to look at the whole idea of, this, uh, of the biblical role of a believer in secular government. And Democracy in America it was written in 1835 by a French philosopher who was just mesmerized by the American experiment during this particular time. America at this point had become uh, a, a nation. It, had, uh, it uh, had a constitution. And it was in this infantile state, but it was beginning to flourish and become established as a nation. He observed, his name is Alexis de Tocqueville, and he observed in Democracy in America this statement. He says, I do not know whether all Americans have a sincere faith in their religion or who can read the human art, but I am certain that they hold it to be indispensable to the maintenance of Republican institutions. This opinion is not peculiar to a class of citizens or to a party, but it belongs to the whole nation and to every rank of society. Without a doubt, religion, Christianity perhaps, but certainly biblical principles, and especially belief in God as a supreme creator and, prov and providence of all things, was a foundational element the United States. If you need any kind of evidence, the fact of the matter is, is many of our, uh, our beloved monuments to the history of our, the founding of our nation have images of Christianity and biblical principles peppered on through it, including at the very top of the rotunda of the Capitol building, you'll see the Assumption of Washington, where Washington is depicted with 13 angels representing the 13 states as he has ascended to heaven as an image of the first president going to heaven. We also have the baptism of Pocahontas. That is also one of the large paintings that is in the rotunda of our capital. At the very top of our Washington Monument is this capstone that says, may God bless um, and be our benefit. You also have at the very um, top there, the Ten Commandments and the floor of the center of our National Archives. We also have, of course, the Jefferson Memorial, a repeated opportunity for, is that better? All right, thank you. Repeated, uh, the repeating of, uh, of God in, as creator and things like that in the Jefferson Memorial. Not only that, in the Supreme Court building, on the very top of the A-frame of the Supreme Court meeting, we have Moses holding the Ten Commandments. And inside, we have Moses holding the Ten Commandments. In our Congress, we have the Ten Commandments on one of the doors, as well as uh, an image of Moses. The only image of Moses, there's a many different people who are uh, displayed on these little plaques all throughout our Capitol building, our Senate floor. But he's the only one that's got a full face. Although under side face, showing he has prominence in that area. Above the Speaker of the House's chair is written, In God We Trust. 
And even in our uh, Library of Congress, you walk in, of all the millions of books that could be displayed in the Library of Congress, only two. They're on either side, flanked on either side of the entrance. One is called the, the, um, the Man's Bible, which is a handwritten Bible. And on the other side is the Gutenberg Bible, one of the very first printed Bibles ever in history. And as if they're having a conversation with one another. And so these are just examples of the monuments of our nation bringing the Bible in prominence and God in prominence. Yet, this devotion to God as has been a part of our DNA has been plucked away, strand by strand, little by little, uh, as our country speeds down this slippery slope. The question is why? Why is it? Well, I already mentioned to you that dark, darkness just does what darkness does. Sinners do what sinners do. It isn't because darkness is getting deeper. It's because the light is getting dimmer. Believers have abandoned our post. So we're called to be ambassadors of Christ and delegates of his kingdom. But we have bought into this lie that we're not supposed to mix politics with religion. Sometimes what happens is we allow them completely separated in the honor of separation of church and state. And then sometimes we just favor one. So we just want to be political with a completely abandonment of our, of our religious or our Christian convictions. So the problem is that we are having to deal with this type of thing. We've evacuated our place in this world, in secular society, particularly in the government. And as true with any time when light goes out, darkness immediately fills that void. So the question I want to ask tonight, or us to look at tonight, is what is the role of a believer in today's public square? What are we supposed to do? How involved should a Christian uh, be in governing in the government in particular? So we're going to address these, these questions. We're going to start by looking at three particular views that are they're popular today, they've all been tried, and they've all failed miserably. And then we're going to conclude with a biblical concept of what the Bible says with regards to our involvement in governmental affairs. So let's look at the first one. How should we influence the, the church to influence the state? Well, the first view is that government should compel religion. That the government should actually push that on us. This is actually quite popular. It has been popular for centuries in Europe. The idea that civil government should compel people to support or follow a particular religion. This is the reason for numerous of conflicts, including the Crusades, the Protestant Reformation, the Spanish Inquisition, the Thirty Years' War, and so on and so on. It is, in fact, this philosophy that drives many current Muslim nations in the world. And so this is also one of the reasons why our pilgrims came to America to flee religious persecution from a state church. So this is the, this is the idea. Now, this is the, the philosophy that somehow the government has a responsibility to get people to become a particular religious identity. What's the response to those types of things? Well, the first one is this. Jesus refused. He absolutely refused to force people to believe in him. Now I'm going to let you know now, there are several passages of scripture we're going to look at. Some of these are on the, on the screen, many of them are not. I'm going to encourage you to find your Bible, either electronically, print. If you don't have one, scoot next to a Christian that they can share with you. But you're going to look at these passages, okay? The first one we see is Luke chapter 9, verse 54 through 56. I'll give you just a second to look it up. Luke 9, 54 through 56. It says, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they're talking about some uh, people who have rejected Christ and the gospel. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them, and he said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, 
but to save them. And they went to another village. When this Samaritan village rejected Christ, the disciples had an excellent suggestion. Let's just nuke them. But Jesus' response was a rebuke. Because the true salvation must come from an open heart to receive. I cannot tell you how many people have had a false salvation because they made a decision to get somebody off their back. Whether it be a mama, a daddy, a wife, a husband, a son, a daughter, a friend, a preacher. If it is not genuine in their heart, they didn't get it. All you've done is created more confusion. Even more so when a government tries to force a religious conviction on someone. The government cannot compel religion because Jesus is a gentleman. He only goes where he is invited. Second, true change that will last must begin with the heart of each person. In Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 5, you remember the story of Jonah. Jonah was this uh, Jewish prophet who absolutely hated the Ninevites. And yet that's exactly where God called him to go, to preach God's judgment, a message of judgment on the Ninevites. So what does Jonah do? He decides to flee. He gets on a boat and goes the exact opposite way than where Nineveh is located, to get as far away as he possibly can from what God had called him to do. You know the story of the great fish. He was thrown overboard. He was swallowed by a great fish. He was vomited onto land. And he finally decided, maybe I should do what God called me to do. So he goes to Nineveh. And this, after he preaches God's judgment in Nineveh, this is the response. What I want you to notice is the order of the people in which the, 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 the did this response. Let's look at what it says in Jonah chapter 3. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word, word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way, from the violence that is in his hand. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works that they had turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Jonah's hatred for, of Nineveh was due to his treatment, the horrible treatment the Ninevites did against people, especially the Jews. But God was not concerned about what they did. God was concerned about their spiritual state. And when the Ninevites and their king repented and worshiped God, their personal lifestyles and their political practices followed suit. But notice the order. It wasn't the king who initiated the repentance. It was the people. And it brought up to the king. True change that, um, that will last must begin with the heart. We can legislate all we want to morality, but unless God changes the heart, it makes no difference. It makes no difference at all. And then third, it exchanges the sovereignty of God with the government. And it puts the secular rulers in an idolatrous and dangerous position. We see this in Matthew 7, 6 through 11. It says, do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, let, and him who knocks, it will be opened. For, or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? Uh, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
How much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? This is in the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And a major theme of the Sermon on the Mount is that of transformational living. As there's a transformation in a person's heart, it will begin to manifest itself in their life. And this is, he's, trying, he's teaching them to break out of these cycles uh, to, uh, that lead to a dead end and actually begin to follow the principles of kingdom values. And so what he does in this particular instance is he actually is given an example of how a Christian disciple has, should relate to the government. In the early Jewish writings, whenever they heard pigs or dogs, it was typically a reflection, a, 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 a reference to Gentiles. And this was certainly no different here. So in that, when Jesus was saying this, the Jewish people would have immediately thought about the Roman government during this particular time. And so he would have, uh, by doing this, they were basically saying, one of the root of your problems is not just the zealots who want to overthrow Rome, but just as evil are these who were idolatrously uh, loyal to Rome, placing trust and hope in Rome for political and economic security. And so just as they were p uh, pigs who were trampling the, the, the pearls as because they looked like grain, or dogs that would tear you to pieces. So the government, when you place them, your trust in the government and any person in the government, that's exactly what you should be able to expect. It's a vicious cycle, a dead-end path that leads to disappointment and even betrayal. It's something like Winston Churchill's definition of appeasement, where he says, an appeaser is one who feeds the crocodile, hoping it will eat you last. Guys, this is very common. How many times do we place our hope in a pig or a dog of our government? Now, I'm not trying to, to besmirch a politician, but we think our salvation is going to be in, well, if Republicans can take over Congress, things are going to be better. It seems to me in my short lifetime there are several times when the Republicans took over Congress, and yet here we are. Well, if so-and-so will get the, get the presidency, then things will be different. Well, it seems that there are several presidents that I really wanted to be in office, have been in office, and yet here we are. It could be that we're placing our trust and our hope in the wrong entity. And so that's what we have. It also finally... If this practice is applied, where government compels religion, if this is applied to Christianity, then it can also be applied to other religions as well, depending on who's in office. If we were going to go down this track, we have a Christian Congress, a Christian president, therefore we're going to employ Christian laws. What happens when we have a Muslim president and a Muslim Congress? Because what's good for the goose is also good for the gander. Is that really what we want? So the first view is government should compel religion. There's a second one, though. The exact opposite. And government should exclude religion. Government should, it's the opposite view. It basically says that we should completely exclude religion from government and politics altogether. This is the view of the ACLU. Americans United for Separation of Church and State. These are the ones who reject prayers given at government meetings or at public places. These are the ones that say that the Ten Commandments have no place in any type of public-owned facilities. The prohibition of the student Bible studies or prayers at sporting events or graduation at public events. These are the type of people that would argue for this. They declare that the old argument of separation of church and state that, uh, that based upon that, people should not mix religion and politics. The government should not attempt to, quote-unquote, legislate morality. What should our response be? Well, first of all, it removes from government God's teaching about good and evil. In Romans chapter 13, verse 4, it states that a government official is God's servant for your good. 1 Peter 2.14 teaches that government officials are sent 
to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. It's their, their, that's what God has allowed them to be a part of. But how can a government that completely excludes God be a servant of God and be able to determine what is evil and what is good? How can they do that? But perhaps more powerfully, it, is, it neglects the real understanding behind the First Amendment and the separation of church and state. Just to make sure, I'm not sure where we all are as far as our understanding of that. Real briefly, let me just help you with this. This is the entire First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. That's the entire one. It covers in that basically five constitutional rights, the one of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. More specifically, we see the first part of it. This is the famous religion portion of the First Amendment. It's divided up into two clauses. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. It is oftentimes known as the Establishment Clause, that Congress cannot make a law that actually helps establish a religion. The Free Exercise Clause is the second part, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Church-state separation was never intended by our forefathers to mean that people of religious conviction were somehow disqualified from bringing their beliefs to bear on the great issues of the public of that day was not the case. In fact, the whole story of separation of church and state between, um, uh, that Thomas Jefferson wrote about in a letter has been used to justify every manner of religious exclusion possible. Here's actually what the First Amendment is essentially saying. There are some who would argue that it is, uh, there's basically three views of it. The avoidance position would be the first. In the avoidance uh, position, I'm going to come back. I may be mixing up your notes, but just bear with me. In the avoidance position, it simply teaches that they believe that the First Amendment banishes religion from any public display on government or public grounds. That absolutely should avoid religion whatsoever. A second view would be the acknowledgement view, which simply argues for a tax-funded religious displays on government property according to the nation's majority religion and to the exclusion of the minority religions. That's the acknowledgement view. And most people believe that those are the only two options you got. And that's not true at all. The fact is, they're both flawed models, and they, do not uh, they, they will not maximize religious freedom in a democratic society. The third option is what is known as accommodation. Simply is this, it contends that the government should accommodate the rights of individuals of any religion to express their religious beliefs in public locales. If somebody wants to erect a nativity scene during Christmas time in a public park, and they, 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 um, they request this from the government, and that government decides they want, that they will allow that, then that also means if a Muslim community wants to come and erect uh, some type of celebration for Ramadan, then they need to be accommodated for that. If a Jewish community comes and they want to put up a large menorah during Hanukkah, then they should be able to accommodate that because the government is not taking sides on religion. It accommodates. The First Amendment provides a neutrality. It's not avoidance and it's not acceptance of any particular religion. It is neutral ground. That's very important and actually much more powerful for the Christian than for a government to be actually uh, trying to enforce the Christian values. By the way, a lot of times people don't even know where the separation of church and state or even the First Amendment came from. Let me take just a moment and tell you this. John Leland was a Baptist minister. He was a Baptist minister, evangelist, during the First Great Awakening. 
he actually was a Congregationalist, a denomination popular at the time. And then he got saved, and he became a Baptist. Who knew? And when he did that, he actually moved to Virginia and North Carolina and began to help establish Baptist churches in those states. His involvement in church-state issues uh, included uh, the, the getting involved with some separate Baptists who were planning to oppose the Constitution of the United States that was being ratified at the time because nine of the 13 original colonies had um, state-sponsored religious uh, denominations, uh, whether it be Presbyterians, Episcopalians, um, or, or, um, or Congregationalists, and they all persecuted Baptists, every one of them. And so these Baptists, which was a large number of them, decided they would not vote for the Constitution because by doing so, they were going to actually fortify these state-run religions or denominations, and it was going to seal their fate. And so, in fact, 10 years earlier than that, during the Re American Revolution, the colonial government of Virginia, along with its Episcopal authorities, began to imprison Baptists for, quote-unquote, disturbing the peace. And the reason is because they were preaching the gospel without a license that was to be submitted by the Episcopalian authorities. Well, these Baptist preachers says, I don't need a license to preach the gospel. And so, off to prison they went. And that's essentially what ended up happening. So the Baptists planned to oppose the Constitution because they were fearful that with a federal government would come federal, tax-supported, persecuting church. And so John Leland tried to avert this crisis by cutting a political deal with James Madison. James Madison basically made this agreement with him. He says, if Leland could get the Baptists to withdraw their opposition and support the ratification of the Constitution, then under the first Congress of that Constitution, Madison would do everything in his power to bring an amendment to the Constitution um, that, that would declare that Congress shall make no law affecting the establishment of religion or that there will be no governmental interference with the free exercise of religion, hence the First Amendment. And that's exactly what the agreement was, and that's what ended up happening. And then in 1791, Leland returned to Massachusetts and resumed his involvement in politics, supporting his friend Thomas Jefferson, who, by the way, was no Christian. He was a deist. Jefferson was a staunch advocate of the First Amendment. In fact, he says, I can't disagree with you more regarding the religions, the, the, your religious convictions, but I will support your right to preach it. And so what ended up happening on New Year's Day after Jefferson's um, inauguration, the first day, New Year's Day, in January the 1st, 1802, Leland came uh, on behalf of the Dansbury Baptist in appreciation of Jeff Jefferson's strong support of religious freedom. He came providing a gift to Jefferson in the White House. It was a half-ton cheese wheel. That's a lot of cheese. During that ceremony, that Friday morning, Leland told Jefferson how he and his colleagues in Massachusetts had been praying for God's blessings on Jefferson. And then he prayed for the President of the United States right then and there. He went out of his way to share this. And then Jefferson thanked Leland and the citizens of western Massachusetts for the cheese, and we went back to the White House. And that afternoon, Jefferson wrote his famous letter to the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, articulating his vision for the religious liberty undergirding the congregational, estab congregational establishment, established church, um, st state church in Connecticut. He did not, uh, he was undergirding the separation of church and state because these Baptists were still being discriminated against the state church in Connecticut. In his letter, in part, it reads this, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate the sovereign reverence that, uh, that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature 
should, quote, unquote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. In other words, the separation of church and state is not actually in the Constitution. It was made famous by Jefferson's letter to the Dansbury Baptists promising that they would not be discriminated against by a state-run church. But wait, there's more. A lot of people believe that Jefferson is the one who originated the separation of church and state uh, coin. That is not the case. As a matter of fact, the phrase comes from a man named Roger Williams, who was the founder of Rhode Island. And he depicted the church as a garden amid the wilderness of the world. There had to be a wall that would protect this garden from this wilderness, lest the wilderness encroach like weeds in the garden and choke out the garden. The church is an intentional counterculture in which Christians are free to grow and to develop and flourish, to disciple and to be discipled. Williams didn't think that the wall between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world should actually be impenetrable. He didn't think that. As a matter of fact, he believed that the garden should seek out, seek and go out and domesticate the wilderness so that more and more of the wilderness would become part of the garden. But there would always be a separation between the two. That is where the idea of separation of church and state comes from, from the originally. It is to protect the church from the world, not the other way around. And finally... It fails to realize that laws are generally based on a moral code rooted in a righteous God, even if that God is not corporately worshipped by those subject to the law. There are religious reasons behind many of our laws, but laws don't establish a religion. As a matter of fact, all major religions have teachings against stealing and murder, for instance. But laws against stealing and murder do not establish a religion. This can be no more clearly denoted than what Abraham Lincoln had to do with when he was running for president. Abraham Lincoln was running for president. He drew a lot of criticism for his vocal opposition against slavery. He said, they, they would tell him, you don't understand. You see, if you keep talking like this about slavery, you're, you're liable to start a war. How predictable. He finally had had enough. And finally one night on the campaign, he stood up behind this podium and he said this. My critics say I should not talk about slavery in politics because that was bringing religion into politics and that I should not talk about slavery in the pulpit because that's bringing um, politics into religion. According to them, there was no place where a man could call this evil thing evil and this wrong thing wrong. The campaign, and this is important, we'll probably bring this back up next week. The campaign to abolish slavery in the U.S. was led predominantly by Christians. That's why it was the result, one of the major results of the Second Great Awakening. And the campaign, by the way, to end racial discrimination and segregation was led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a Baptist pastor who preached against racial injustice from the Bible. These are some things that we clearly embrace as immoralities that we had to correct. These were legislations that were based on moral code. But just because they were based on a moral code doesn't mean that they have established a religion. Third view, do evangelism, not politics. This is a particularly popular one, especially during an election year. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in that pew back there during a particular election year. Our pastor stood right here. He's not endorsed a particular candidate, but he does speak out about an issue. 
And as soon as he does, he has brought politics into religion, and people get up and leave because the church has no business talking about these current affairs. They should just stick to the gospel. And they leave. There are many people who will not go to this church because of that very reason. This is the view that they have. What's our response? Most religions compel a change in, their, in the individual which will inevitably result in a transformation of society, just like Nineveh, as we discussed. You know, Matthew 28, 20 does tell them, tell us to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. All things. What are those things that Jesus commanded us? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another as I have loved you. To um, sell all you have, give to the poor, and take up your cross and follow me. What are the different types of teachings? There's a whole lot more to Jesus' teachings than just the gospel. Uh, clearly, that was the, a primary one. But he also said, if someone were to strike you on the right cheek, give them the other cheek also. If somebody compels you to go a mile, go with the two. There's a lot more to it. The message of a religion is supposed to result, the message of Christianity, the gospel, is supposed to result in changed lives. And if enough people have their lives changed, it will result in changed families. And it will also result in changed neighborhoods, changed schools, and then ultimately changed businesses, changed societies. Secondly, Christians have influenced governments positively throughout history. It's because of the influence of Christianity on governments throughout history that we see incredible changes. Let me just give you a few of them. And if you're interested in the book, Alvin Schmidt wrote the book, How Christianity Changed the World. And he lists a number of them. In A.D. 374, because of Christians... Infanticide, child abandonment, and abortion was outlawed in the Roman Empire. In 404, gladiator games, battle to the death gladiator games were outlawed. In 315, the cruel punishment of branding the faces of criminals was outlawed. 361, the, the government instituted prison reforms like separating male and female prisoners. In 1829, the government prohibited the practice of burning widows alive in India because their, their husband had died. In 1912, they had banned the painful and crippling practice of binding young women's feet in China. Because of Christian influence in government, human sacrifice in Ireland and Eastern European countries were stopped. Property rights and protections to women began and pedophilia became outlawed because of the witness and the influence of Christians in the government. So while I do not disagree that we need to do, uh, to do religion, to do evangelism, to say we cannot be, it should not be involved in the governmental affairs, if we were to hold true to that philosophy, what kind of world would we live in? Case in point. If you were to call a service center for your cell phone, you're likely to find, I want to get on the phone with somebody from Asia. Do you realize that in a nation of India, some of the most technologically advanced um, minds have come out of India. Some of your greatest medical minds have come out of India. Because of the Hindu religion dominating the Indian nation for, for centuries, they didn't believe in schools or hospitals. Certainly don't believe in technological advancement. The reason why there are hospitals and schools and the technological advancement that there, what we see so replete in India now is because of Christian missionaries who went there. So while we should do evangelism, to say we have no business in politics is absurd. So, and I'm really quickly I'm running out of time, so I need to do this quickly. What should be our, um, our role? Let me just start with a 
the right perspective. I put this on the board, uh, on the screen, because I really want you to pay attention to this. This is oftentimes used, the passage is used to talk about separation of church and state, that Jesus, Jesus talked about separation of church and state. So let's read it. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they may entangle him in his talk, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true. Teach the way of God in truth, nor, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You see the trick question here? But Jesus perceived their wickedness, and he said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. And so they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So Jesus, they, were, they, they see the entrapment. If Jesus would say, yes, you should pay Caesar, then it looks like he's abandoning God. If he says, no, you should just pay to God, then of course he's, he's creating um, uh, treason. But then he asked this question, whose likeness, whose inscription is this? And they said, Caesar. And he says, so give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and God what belongs to God. He was not talking about some kind of implied church-state separation because that would have been completely absurd and foreign to the mind of a first century Jew in the Roman Empire. Jesus goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 with this question. When God created humankind, if you recall, it says in Genesis 1, starting in verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So what he does is he says, yes, coins do bear the image of Caesar, and so therefore taxes should be paid to him. But the truth is, is that which bears one's image belongs to that person. So while the coin has Caesar's image and it should be paid in taxes, everything, all humans, including Caesar, are made in the image and the likeness of God. And so everything we have belongs to God the Creator. He is the master over Caesar and over all governments. So sure, honor the government, pay the taxes, but recognize who's the real authority. Who really owns it all? So with that perspective, the Bible actually doesn't give us direct instructions on how to be involved in the government. It does give us uh, several examples. I'm just going to do these quickly. Daniel. Just for the record, Daniel is a slave in Babylon. He was a part of the exile, taken captive, and moved to a pagan city, a pagan nation called Babylon. And in this place... He becomes, he, God uses him to, and flourishes him to have an influence in the government. One particular time, he was asked for guidance by the king himself, the emperor of Babylon. And this is Daniel's response in Daniel 4, 27. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous. This is the slave talking to the king of Babylon. Let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. It's quite clear that Daniel had a significant role as an advisor to the king. At this particular time, he was a high official in Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's court. And according to Daniel 2.48, he was a ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. He was regularly at the king's court, a slave, a Jewish boy, captive. Notice what he didn't say, though, which many would say that you need to say. This is what, what he did not say when he came, when Nebuchadnezzar came for his advice. He didn't say, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, I am a Jewish prophet, but I would not presume to oppose my Jewish moral standards upon your Babylonian kingdom. Ask your astronomers and soothsayers. They will guide you in your own traditions. Then follow your own heart. It would not be my place to speak to you about right and wrong. That would be both inappropriate and intolerant. He didn't say that. Some other examples of believers in 
the Old Testament had a, an influence on pagan nations. Joseph was the high official in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. Moses confronted Pharaoh directly. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king, and his influence not only gave him permission to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem, but he got the resources from Persia to do it. Esther was the queen of Persia. And because of her influence in the king, she saved the entire people of the uh, nation of Israel. They were captive in Persia. Other Old Testament believers who had, uh, had an influence on pagan nations included Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Nahum, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Zephaniah, and Amos. Then we go to the New Testament. John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a, prof a prophet, a preacher. And in Matthew 14, 3 through 4, it talks about how Herod had arrested John, put him in prison because of what John was saying. It says, For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Later on in Luke 3, 18 through 20, it says, Many other exhortations he preached to them. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. John the Baptist rebuked the Tetrarch, the governor of Israel, for his relationship, his adulterous affair with his sister-in-law, as well as all the evils which Herod had done. He boldly spoke to the officials of the empire about moral right and wrong and their governmental policies, and he got locked up for it and eventually was killed because of it. And yet Mark 6, 20 says that he called John a righteous and holy man. And in fact, Jesus himself said that John the Baptist was the greatest man born among women. If Jesus thought, was frowning upon John's in, uh, interaction with the governmental officials, it would seem to me that he would not have said what he said about John. It seems that that's exactly what Jesus was complimenting him on, at least in that particular point. Then we see the Apostle Paul in Acts 24, 24 to 25. Paul's under trial by Felix, a Roman official. And after some days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and he heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. Luke doesn't give any more details than this, but the fact that, that Felix was afraid or he was alarmed because Paul was reasoning, and the word simply means to dialogue. He was just talking to him about the righteousness and about the coming judgment. Seems to indicate that Paul was talking more about moral standards of right and wrong, and Felix fell under conviction, and he became alarmed because of it. Not only that, Paul was a Roman citizen who was arrested. And he had the right as a Roman citizen to, to stand trial before Caesar himself. Now, most Bible scholars would argue that Paul's accusations, the ones that were uh, the accusations against Paul were so ridiculous, so absurd, he would have been acquitted had he just let Felix and Festus deal with this. But Paul uh, requested a hearing before Caesar. And likely the reason is, is because he wanted an audience with the most powerful man on earth at that time to influence him with the gospel of Christ. There are many examples of how we can be involved in our government. Now, what should we do? Just real quickly, some ways, some significant ways for Christians to be involved. Number one, know and vote the principles of the faith, not of your faith, of the faith, of the scriptures, of the gospel message, not your particular preferences. It's not enough to know the issues. It's enough also to vote 
um, based upon the perspective of Christianity to support the Christian values. Kingdom principles should trump your personal preferences. Let me be a little more clear. Instead of voting over your race or ethnic beliefs, you ought to vote the Bible. Instead of voting over your pocketbook or your personal security, you ought to vote the Bible. Instead of voting over somebody's magnetic appeal or whether you find them to be insulting, listen, you're not voting for your next door neighbor. You're voting for a congressman or a president. Vote your convic vote the, the principles of the scriptures. No one vote based upon that are values that are consistent with the faith. Number two, take a public stand on God's word about the moral and ethical issues of today. If people of faith do not publicly speak out about what their faith teaches regarding issues of right and wrong, where else are they going to get it? Where else are they going to get it? And by the way, this isn't a Republican or Democrat thing or a libertarian thing. This is a biblical thing. This may come as a shock to you, but there are all political parties have moments where they are in violation with Scripture. So let's vote Scripture. Let's stand up for the Word of God. Engage the public square. Write letters to your congressmen, your officials, dealing with issues as the biblical, uh, based upon biblical principles. Give time and money to support specific candidates or issues that are consistent with the faith. Consider the high calling of public service. Notice what I didn't say. Con consider the high calling of politics. Now, I understand in the way our system works, if you're going to be an elected official, you're likely to have to get in, uh, have to get go through the whole political system. There's a whole different, uh, the, the totally different thing to go through the political system to be an elected official than to become a political person. Don't be a political person. You have to get, run through the, fine. Let's serve our nation according to God's principles, not as a particular political uh, affiliate. I'm going to ask the pastor Mike to come up and, and begin to make a transition to our Q&A. But I do want to, as in a way of conclusion, I want to bring something up that I think you need to hear as a way of conclusion. Is it morally right to receive a great deal of benefits that our nation provides without anything in return? When the, the original signers of the Declaration of Independence were um, publicly declaring themselves, um, they basically were saying, we are guilty of treason against Great Britain. And they knew that that crime would inevitably result in their death should they lose this war. And the fact is, is they had very little confidence, if any, that they would actually win a war against the most powerful nation at that time. Yet... The very last line of the Declaration of Independence reads this. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The independence from Britain did not come cheaply. About 4,500 Americans died in that Revolutionary War. Later wars were even worse. In the Civil War, 550,000 Americans died. World War I, 116,000. World War II, 405,000. The Korean War, 36,000. Vietnam War, 58,000. The Afghan and Afghanistan Wars, 4,500 and counting. Many others equal to or more than those were killed or, or um, those killed were also wounded in these same wars. And then these hundreds of thousands of men and women sacrificed their lives to protect and preserve the freedoms we 
and joy. So the question I'm going to pose to you again, is it right that we simply enjoy these freedoms while giving back very little in return? Or is it not right that all of us at least do something than merely vote to preserve and, uh, and protect this nation? Moreover, Christ died to save us. And he called us to be ambassadors of his kingdom to this world. If we don't, who will? The reason why America is getting darker is because we are doing exactly what Christ told us not to do. We are putting our, our light under a bushel. Let your light so shine that they may, when they see your good works, they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. If we want to see this world change, the darkness to be penetrated, all we've got to do is shine our light. You say, I've just one light. Did you not notice that everybody in this vast auditorium, when it was black dark, could still see that candle? Don't ever underestimate the power of one light. We're going to go to our time now of Q&A. Any questions you may have, you're welcome to, um, to raise your hand. We have a couple of runners that are ready and waiting to uh, bring you to the microphone. And I look forward to hearing what you have. Don't anybody start, everybody start at the same time. Greetings. I'll be the first to ask a question. While I definitely will take personal responsibility of needing to be a light in the dark world, and I'm not saying that that's not our call or an important thing to do, but my question, however, is um, we do know that in the end days, things are going to happen. And, you know, it, like the word says, people will be lovers of themselves. And, you know, and, and that's what's happening. And it's all about me, me, me and what I want. And though, yes, we have a responsibility to talk and speak out and be that light, um, there is a darkness still that is out there. And, I, and is this not part of the plan, is what I'm asking, for what's going on right now? Is this not part of what should be happening, the darkness growing, um, people just being care about themselves, and, um, and so on? Fair enough. That's a good question. Uh, no, this is not part of the plan. Whenever God puts that stuff out there in Scripture, He doesn't say, I have declared this to happen. I have chosen for this to happen. I am making these people happen this way. He is referring to the fact that this is what happens. This is what is happening because we discover that the believers tend to step out of their responsibility. And the minute that believers step out of their responsibility, immediately the darkness is going to start taking over. And so in the end, there still needs to be a remnant of people that are doing the very best we can to share that gospel light. And that light doesn't necessarily have to be, and I think it's often misconstrued, that it has to be, uh, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? Do you know those things? God clearly teaches us that our behavior many times is what we have to use. In public square and a lot of other areas, it's how you treat somebody, how you demonstrate respect, whether you're giving a single glass of water in the name of Jesus or things like that that help to be a very clear definitive contrast to the way that the world is. If you're out living in the world today, I think it's pretty honestly easy to understand just how uh, difficult it is today. It's hard out there today. People are not nice like they used to be. Uh, people are not helpful like they used to be. If you're on the side of the road broken down, guess what? We don't stop. And the reason we don't stop is because we've been taught that you're a mass murderer and going to kill us. Not that, and, and we've chosen to believe that. Now, I think you have to be careful and you have to decide who you are and what you're able to handle. But at the same time, are we not still capable of believing that there is basically some good in people? I know that Jesus talks about from a salvation standpoint, there's not. But there, are, you know, not everybody's out there to kill you and not everybody's out there to harm you. And there's ways to help each other out. And it is in that helping. It is in being nice. It is in doing those things that I think that we're able to shed light. 
And Jesus told us, he said, you know, you should live your life in such a way that people see your good works. That's exactly how he said, let your light shine. He said, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify your Father in heaven. Which is one of the reasons that the church does so much work, whether it's our one-for-one -one offering. Uh, I had uh, the radio station, Tommy Gunn, that's on B100 FM. Uh, he was one that was campaigning for the feedings, uh, feeding for the summertime for our kids. Uh, many kids are fed uh, free for, for them, are fed, fed free from the school systems. But whenever summertime hits, they don't have anything to eat. Now, whatever we think of that, whether they should pay for the food or have somebody to buy it or not, the reality is that they don't. And so this last one-for-one -one offering that we gave, we gave to the summer feeding program to try to help people throughout the summer. Tommy Gunn was a great advocate of that. Tommy Gunn is a Christian. Every time he closes his radio show, which is a secular radio show, uh, he always says, uh, please know that Jesus loves you, and so do I. And whenever we donated that to that, he called us up. My, he called my wife up. Actually, had a secretary call my wife up because he didn't know what my name was. And he said, hey, I want to give a shout out to Pastor Kenny and your church for what they have done. And, of course, they put that out there on the radio. People heard about that, you know, had some contact about that. And we're just appreciative. And I think that that's ways that, they, that they're like, they're still good out there. Still people that are good out there. Uh, it's not part of the plan for darkness to come. It's part of the reality that darkness is going to come. It's not really a plan. Uh, because if it was part of the plan, then we would have to charge God with doing things that are inconsistent with his nature and character. We can't exactly see you. <laughs> it's pretty bright up here. Is it possible to be so patriotic and such a nationalist that it offends God? I've had people that are woke say to me that you know, because you're so patriotic that you don't care for people in other countries, which isn't the case, of course. But is there a point where that could be excessive, where God would find it offensive? I'm going to make sure I understand your question. Is there a point where a person can be so patriotic, and I think you use the term nationalist, where it trumps God? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? No, just, just really loving your country. Just, okay. So, uh, we're, we're living in your country, but is it to the point where you're trumping God? Or are you saying that some people would accuse uh, just loving your country as being too patriotic or even putting it before God? Is that... Or that they think that you don't care about people in other countries. You know, that oh, they're I against see. the borders. They just think that, you know, um, we shouldn't be so patriotic nowadays. They're not, they're not loving America like they used to because I think it's wrong. Uh, okay. So in other, uh, instead of uh, worrying about other countries, we, we just want to take care of America first. It was a political slogan on a, few, a few years ago. And the concept is, is that if we have that type of mentality, sometimes people can accuse uh, someone of that mentality to uh, neglect other people who are in need. Is that basically right? So, well, how I would share that is this. Um, the light that shines the farthest shines brightest at home. If you were on an airplane and all of a sudden you lost cabin pressure, you've, uh, if you've ever flown, you know the, the whole drill. You could probably do it rather than the flight attendants. And what do they say? The, the little air, the face mask come down. Who are you to take care of first? Yourself. Why should you take care of yourself rather than the person beside you, even if it's your child? Because if you're not in a position, a healthy position to be able to take care of, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be in a position to be able to take care of anyone else. So it's not to say that we are at the complete, um, uh, that we are at the complete neglect of the, of the nations. It is to make sure that we have, we've got to take care of ourselves first so we can be in a position to have the resources, to have the strength to be able to help others. But. I want to tag it on that. I think the answer is yes. Yes, we can be so patriotic that we turn off other people. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to make sure that we recognize where our patriotism comes from. 
Uh, I think we should be massively patriotic. I think there should be way more patriotism than we have right now, but not to the point that we pick on another country, if you, especially if you don't know anything about them. If you don't know who they are, what I would say is that we've got to be careful that we don't push our politics over on the actual people because there are many countries that are under massive oppression. Can you imagine uh, charging the North Korean people with the, the atrocities of their leader? I don't think there's a North Korean person that wants to be associated with Kim Jong or any of those people that are over there because he's such a wicked man. And so there are governments that we really don't like, and we don't like the governments because of the uh, humanitarian issues in their, in their polities and things like that. And I think we should make that distinction. However, to be proud of our government because of what it does and how it recognizes and honors the individual person, how it honors our ability to have the freedom to live as the we want to, I don't think that there's a single thing wrong with that. But if you get to the point where you think that we are better than we are, then we got to be careful. Jesus yeah. made the statement through the Apostle Paul that we have to think about ourselves soberly and righteously, not higher than we should think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. God has given an incredible amount of faith to the United States of America, and America has done some incredible things around the globe, and so, yes, you should be very, very proud of that, but not to the criticism of another nation. I think that to identify the reasons why we would have disagreements with other nations on a principled basis, then I think that's perfectly fine. But obviously, you can, we can all be overzealous in some area. But I think that America is far from overzealous on their patriotism at this moment. In fact, it's almost non-existent. So we've got a long ways to go. We've lost a lot. Uh, America, many years ago, when it was extremely patriotic, was, in my estimation, a much more enjoyable country to live in. And it was at that time that everybody was trying to get here. It is not our patriotism that's harming us today. It is our politics. Deb, Debbie, can I... Are you asking that if, if uh, from a Christian standpoint, that we think we're better than another country? No, it's just some woke people that I know <laughs> act like we shouldn't have borders, that it's wrong to, to love your country and... Okay. You know. That would just be totally unbiblical. Right. If anybody ever established a border, it was God. <laughs> if any, uh, I'm not exactly sure what Nehemiah was doing as he built the wall around the city, making sure that nobody could get in. That woke person needs to just get a little bit more intelligent about the Word of God. They're, they're a little bit ignorant about the Word of God. There's entire, read the book of Numbers. It gives you entire teachings about borders, protecting borders, boundaries, all those types of things. We're not wrong in doing that at all. Not scripturally. Hey guys, um, my question is, I'm Veronica, hey. <laughs> um, my question is, I personally interact a lot with the Hispanic community and a lot of people unfortunately have broken laws to come into the US but they're here at this point, and if they require help or resources or you want them to be able to better their life, so how do you deal with working intimately with a community that you know is breaking a law, that you disagree with the way that they got here, but yet once they're here, you want them to have access or to have help or to know the Lord or some of them worship the Lord. So how do you deal with those two things I guess, and still represent God effectively. You want me to answer that? <laughs> that is a tough question, Veronica, and it's a very, very good question. Yeah. Uh, I think that, again, what we're discovering is that the America that we once knew has very much slipped out of our hands. It has become so incredibly political. When I say political, I mean it's become such a, a divided party issue with extreme measures on both sides, Republican, Democrat, and the libertarians are in there somewhere. We've become so uh, in, entrenched in that that we have lost sight of who our true identity was. America is a country that invited all people to come in and be a part of who we are. 
America had a plan for naturalization and inviting people in. The plan for that naturalization was to make sure that we didn't invite in people that would be injurious to the general population that is already here. Whether that happened to be financially or physically or through disease or, th or certain things like that. So our government established an immigration policy and a naturalization policy to make sure that if anybody wanted to come in here, there was a clearly legal way to come in. One of the things that has happened in our nation now is that through political issues, through drug trafficking, through things like that, and through uh, what used to be very well-managed borders, now our borders are pretty much wide open. Every criminal, or I should say many criminals, many people that would never pass naturalization are being freely allowed into this country. The end result of that is that it has now painted a picture across the board for the Hispanic community, the Mexican community, whoever that might be, it has painted a clear, uh, a same line, a painted with the same brush across there, and it injures those people who could or would or would have the possibility of coming in and being naturalized as an American citizen. Our country should, in a, in, in, our, in a, let me make a distinction between what we should be, which is governmental as opposed to political, because politics have nothing to do with government. Government is all about how we manage our life. Politics is how we mess with people. So if we were an appropriate government, we would, we would focus our attentions on the immigration side of government and figure out a plan for the people that we would normally naturalize and have not got criminal backgrounds or things like that and figure out if there's a fast-track way that we could get them here and do it safely because they're already here. Uh, many of them are working. Honestly, it's a wordplay. They don't want them to leave because if they left, we would be in a pretty bad situation in a lot of areas and nobody necessarily wants to admit that. But there has to be a governmental uh, a focus on being able to do that because God is a God of order and God is a God of law. Now, if you just go uh, ad hoc deport everybody, I think you create a much larger situation because now we've created a worse situation than the situation that we currently have. The deadlock that we have going on is a deadlock in Congress and a deadlock in the White House that refuses to appropriately address this issue. And the reason they won't appropriately address the real issues that we have going on is because we now have the leaders that I was reading about this morning that was going to take, 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 take everything from us. We have political leaders that are motivated by money and money only. And because they only want money, they don't really care what happens to other people. This is one of the reasons why we have to be proactive in government. It's one of the reasons why we need to replace some of our current government leaders with some people that have solid, well-thinking minds that can figure out ways to address issues such as this that would be as uh, harmless as possible, but then there are some things that are going to have to be addressed from a legal or a non-legal standpoint. That's just the reality of law. This is a nation of law, and we have to abide by law. Sometimes that is very challenging for other people. Sometimes it is not. I think we also have to address that when a person chooses to come in illegally, that doesn't make them a bad person, but they have made a choice to make an illegal movement, and they are subject to the law that is out there. Whatever that's going to end up being, as unfortunate as it can be, it, it has to happen. But, and, and right now, the way that it's going to happen is not going to be in a very, very nice way because we are more about fighting over issues like transgenderism, the LGBTQ community, uh, those types of issues that are smokescreen issues in order to cover up what's really going on, which is a monetary situation, and we're ignoring the real issues of life. Immigration has always been one of the number one parts of being an American citizen was the freedom to say, bring us in these people that want to come in and let's figure out a way to get them in here. We've abandoned that. How are we going to change that? Y'all need to sign up to vote. You need to vote biblical values. You need to find good candidates to put in there. And then you need to support them. And we can, f and we can see if it turns around. This is a long-term gridlock in Washington. I don't see uh, any real movement on it at all in this current uh, administration. Or I don't know what will happen in, in 2024. But I will say that the previous administration was actually moving in a good direction toward making that happen, and it was completely dismantled. So here we are. Let me tag on to that um, from, a, I guess, a church's perspective um, to try to be 
bit more, a little bit more specific to your question. How should we um, address the Hispanic community, especially those who have um, come, uh, who have found their, themselves here by some sort of illegal means? And that comes in a variety of ways, by the way. Uh, so what I would point to in a principle from Scripture is the book of Philemon. Uh, those of you who are not sure of the backstory of Philemon, Paul was in prison. There was a man named Philemon who had a slave named Onesimus. Uh, for whatever reason, doesn't really give a great deal of the reason why, but Onesimus uh, was a slave to Philemon, and he left. He ran away, and which in that time frame was uh, he would be uh, subject to being killed for that uh, abandonment of his post. He found his way to the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. Paul spent some time with Onesimus, uh, ministered to him. Onesimus, apparently, according to this letter, uh, came to Christ. And uh, then Paul wrote, writes this letter. So the one chapter book in the, book of, uh, in the New Testament, it is a letter, personal letter to Philemon, describing what had happened to Onesimus and encouraging Philemon, who was carrying the letter back to his, his uh, master on behalf of Paul uh, to uh, basically giving him some instructions, some encouragement on what he should do with Onesimus. Uh, and so the point in sharing that is this. What Philemon did, excuse me, what Onesimus did was illegal. Now, whether it's just or not is irrelevant. According to the law of that time, it was illegal. Uh, Paul took care of Onesimus in the best way that he could in the situation he was in. But ultimately, Paul had Onesimus go back and take personal responsibility for his infraction. He did all that he could to make that as easy as possible. And in fact, he encouraged Philemon to let him, to not treat him as a slave any longer, but as a brother, essentially to free him. Uh, so the point, though, is that there was a point where we, the, as, using that as a principle, we can do everything we, we should do everything we can to help them in their time of need because many times, like Onesimus, they're not coming over here because they want to break the law. They're coming here because they don't see any other hope. We recognize that. We need to help them as best we can, but ultimately we've got to encourage them and put them in the very best position we can for them to take responsibility for that in hopes that they can return the right way. And man alive, the opportunities that open up for somebody who does something the right way is boundless. But it's very limited, and they live oftentimes in a shadow of fear when they don't. And it's really unfortunate, and we would try to help with that. But it takes time for us as a church to care for them and to encourage them to take responsibility for that and to do it the right way. And I, I've assumed, too, that there's fear uh, of the consequences that could take place. And I would encourage that as well as that God, two rights don't make a wrong, or two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, I would leave that up to God, but I would, I would encourage, let's do it the right way. Uh, so that, again, our witness as believers is at tack here, that regardless of the consequences, I place my whole trust in God, uh, and he can use that situation to influence or impact somebody else. And sometimes I think it's the fear of, of having to go back to our, uh, the country, maybe ever, never being granted the ability to come back, but again, we're putting our limitations on that and not allowing God to, to work in that situation. So I think sometimes fear is there as well. All right. So thank you, gentlemen. I do so appreciate this presentation. And thank you, Joe, for all your great points. There is one more way, though, that we can get involved. So I, I love the idea about emailing, probably not writing letters. But you can write letters if you want to and all that. But I, we do not, I, a lot of people do not realize that you can sign up for boards and commissions here in New Hanover County, and I believe in Brunswick as well. 
I would love to see more of you all doing that. I was just I was just appointed by the county commissioners to the Women's Commission. I'm on Parks and Gardens. There are 50 of them, and there are at-large positions that you can get on as well as designated positions, um, like if you're a nurse or if you're some type of professional, there are those positions on these boards and there's at large where you don't have to have a certain, a certain um, you know, uh, job or whatever. So it would be great. We need more influence of Christ followers. I think I'm the only one. John Hinn and I sit on one board, so I know there's another one, but I think I'm the only one on this women's commission, and I'm just going to be a light. I'm going to shine my light. I'm not going to beat people up, but I'm going to shine my light, and we need you to do that. All you have to do is go on the New Hanover County website at, on boards and commissions. I will help you do that. Come see me. I will help you apply. And then I'll put good words in, in. I know a lot of people, and I'll put a good word in for you. We need more Christ followers on these boards. We have, we have abandoned being part of this process, and, we, and I'm just as guilty. And we love being around our Christian friends and our Christian circles, but we need to be light in the community. Thank you, Lindy. I agree with that. I, whenever I have had opportunity, I've done a lot of work downtown and had to do a lot of things here in our community and for our church. And it's always a blessing whenever I'm like, hey, I know the person that's on the board, and this one's a believer. And that's the channel I'm going to go through. They have influence, and we have had so much strategic movement forward whenever there's a believer that's out there. When there's not, it's a challenge. It really is. And so you might be surprised. A little bit of help here, a little bit of help there in a variety of places, and when there's more than just one, it makes a huge difference. So, C. Lindy should be glad to help you. Thank you for that. All right. Delaney, I think Lori also has a question. Um, lady in the red shirt, do you still have one, Lori? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, mine's kind of a two-part question. So, I think that many of us in the room would agree that we probably do not shine our light and take stand on those tough issues like transgenderism, homosexuality. Um, so the first part of the question is, what are questions that we could ask ourselves to reflect on areas where maybe we're not standing for biblical truth? And then the other extreme is, we all know that the gospel is really offensive, like it's offensive to hear like you're a sinner and you're on your way to hell, but it is truth. And there are other people that we are overly offensive, like kind of like what was discussed earlier where people are turned off because they're like, you're just hateful, you're a bigot. So what are questions that we can also ask ourselves to reflect on? Are we adding to the offense of an already offensive gospel and how can we present the gospel which is already offensive and allow it to, you know, to work on people and change them without us turning people off from listening to the truth of the gospel? Well, I'm going to jump into that one. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm trying to think how I want to respond to that. The, gospel, the Word of God says the gospel is offensive, okay, first and foremost. And I'm thinking about my own self uh, personally uh, when I first came to Christ how coming out of darkness into light and then starting to read the Word of God and, and realize uh, that people are going to go to hell without accepting Christ. And I would share that, that boldly. Uh, and again, probably turn a lot of people away. But I've come to realize... Uh, not so much just saying something. I had to recognize what the Apostle Paul said. I've been crucified with Christ, and the life that I live now is no longer mine, but Christ in me. And so I had to recognize, I think, our lack of commitment to Christ uh, has blurred the lines of the gospel. I don't think some people know what side we stand on. We can say we're believers, but then is our, our lifestyle demonstrating that? We come to church on Sunday, but are we 
uh, doing good works, as Pastor said? Are we allowing our light to shine? And I come to realize that the fact that uh, I'm going to share the truth. I just, I just had a conversation before this about baptism, that we are only supposed to baptize in the name of Jesus. Now, that does say that in the book of Acts. However, in Matthew, it says we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to get in an argument with somebody about the gospel when the Word of God has already made that clear. And so, to be offensive, uh, I don't think you're going to win anybody over. I think I will uh, be kind to you. I will share with you the truth of the Word of God. Uh, and as Pastor said, so I can't make anybody make a decision. I, that's your decision. But I'm not going to beat you over the head with it. Uh, when it comes to the transgender, homosexuality, I, I think all of us in here think the word, the word of God is true and is very clear. I, I cannot change that. But I'm going to accept you for who you are. I will love you as a person. But I probably never will accept your lifestyle. Can we agree with that? You know, is it okay that we could associate, but I'm never going to agree with you, and you're probably never going to agree with me? Is that, can we agree on that? That would be a question if I'm dealing with somebody from that sect of life, or even if it's alcohol. Is it okay I don't drink? It's okay that you drink. Can, can we still, you know, have a conversation? Can we still be friends? Is, is that offensive? And I think sometimes we, as believers, we're the ones that uh, feel like, oh, I can't offend them. How many times do they offend you? And they don't care. And I'm not, please hear me, I'm not saying we should offend them. That's not what I'm saying over there. But you have to look at their questions. We try to always answer the questions. Why not have them answer the questions? Why not ask them why they believe the way they believe? What source did they come up with that? So, again, we're, we're always on the uh, defense sometimes. Like, we're supposed to have all the answers what, what do they stand on? That would be my question to them, one of the questions. What's your source? Where do you draw what you believe from based on what would be some of the questions I would ask in that. Let me uh, pick up on that. That's really good. Um, that's a really hard question, Allie. What questions, should, what questions do I ask myself? in those things. And we're going to be dealing with many of those things you just described the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I think it's an important principle to recognize is to follow the example of Christ in this. Jesus made the comment uh, stated in Matthew 5 that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and Sadducees, you will in no way um, inherit the kingdom of God. And then he commences and basically says everything that the Pharisees and Sadducees taught you is baloney. Let me just tell you what it actually says. Even, he would even talk to, uh, uh, address the Pharisees and Sadducees and call them whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. He, he said, hell will be hotter for you. He was quite clear. He didn't mix words about the Pharisees and Sadducees as an institution, as a group. But when he spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he didn't uh, candy coat what he said to Nicodemus but he spoke to Nicodemus not as a Pharisee but as a person he was also mentioned in uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount that um, if you so much as look upon a woman and, with lust and you have already committed adultery with her and yet we see in John chapter 4 he speaks to the Samaritan woman at the well who had had multiple adulterous affairs uh, herself he didn't whitewash or candy coat the issue, but he spoke to her as a person. When we are speaking, the questions I ask myself is, 
who is my audience? When the audience is, uh, for a lack of a better way of saying it, public policy, then we have to say, thus saith the Lord, and this is how it is. And, and it's going to be offensive, but it's still the Scriptures. But when I'm talking to an individual, say a homosexual, they are qu quite clear on my stand on that. But I'm not going to judge them on that and, and make them feel terrible about their homosexuality, their struggle with, with their gender issues. Because here's what I recognize. I may be so eloquent and so powerful that I could lead them to a straight life. But if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord, they're still going to hell. So I would much rather lead them to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do His work in their life. Uh, to, uh, if, if, they, if, if they meet Jesus, the chances are they're going to, to find some of these, their, um, the problems. They're going to be fine rectified because the Holy Spirit can do a whole lot better job than I can in those things. See, the question I ask, who is my audience? Is it a group of people we're talking about public policy or, or what the Scripture says about principles? That's one thing. But when I'm talking to an individual, I need to know who am I dealing with here. And also, secondly, what is the end game? What is the goal? What am I trying to accomplish? Am I wanting to win an argument or am I trying to win a person? So this is the two questions, many of the questions that I will ask whenever I'm addressing those types of things. Get All this right, question. <laughs> so if I can get this question out right. Um, looking at what you said about taking a stand on God's word with uh, moral and ethical issues, one of the things over the last year with Roe versus Wade being overturned, I've gotten into some discussions with coworkers and people in the community about kind of my pro-life beliefs as a Christian and coming at it from somebody who was adopted and has a special needs child as well. I know I could probably be a little bit more emotional about it, so often I get the response from people, well, not everybody wants to be a special needs parent or they should have the right to decide if that's going to be their course in life or not everybody can deal with the thought of having a child out there in the world somewhere that they don't know about, which they both feel like very selfish to me. So I just wondered, is there a better way to, I don't know, have a conversation with people about that where it comes from more sound position versus kind of getting emotional sometimes from the perspective I guess I come from it at as a Christian, how I can have a better conversation with people about abortion. I think in both of those issues, whether it was um, Alejandra or, or Lee, um, who is uh, Lori. Lori, okay. What is a person's real need? I think there's a couple of things that the Bible tells us that sometimes we choose to forget. In terms of offensiveness, the Bible says to the one person, I'm the aroma of life, and to another person, I'm the aroma of death. It's, just, it's what if I'm saying the same thing. So it really depends on the person a little bit more. When I find God speaking very harshly and straightforwardly and sometimes even angrily in Scripture, it is always to the religious people. I don't think that you'll find a single instance in Scripture where God is speaking to a sinner that's unsaved, that's not religious, that doesn't really know him, where he says anything mean or anything hard or challenging. But his hard speech is to religious people who became religious. They were not people of faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 reminds us that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit because they're spiritually discerned. So if a person is lost, they can't really understand those things. I think it's important to understand that uh, the natural mind uh, leans to the flesh and the spiritual mind leans to the spirit. So here we are speaking a saved person, speaking to an unsaved person, and we're pushing an, an issue. I think that that's probably uh, a failure almost every time. I think a person, uh, one of the things that I think that we forget as a church, and I shared this this morning, that God gives personal authority to an individual for self-government. God gives authority to a husband and a wife for uh, household government. God gives authority to parents for uh, the children and the family government. But then God puts together the church. When he put together the church, it is completely unlike those first three institutions because those first three institutions were individual. The church institution is not. It is a body it is a body made up of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are gifted in a variety of different ways. 
with the size. We, we too often, I think, look at the church individually. As, we look at ourselves as a total individual, not recognizing that we are part of a much larger body. The church has the strength that would far exceed any government that's out there. I think the challenge that you find in the church, and I think in a, a, a valid response to church people that would talk about abortion or something like that is, what are you doing about it? You guys point your finger at us and you tell us that we shouldn't do that, but we don't have any other option. Our government provides us an option. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm, my pa parents don't like it. They're going to dis disown me. Uh, it's going to ruin my career or whatever. Whatever reasons they give, that obviously they're, they're not ones that God would necessarily want to accept. But the truth is, what's the alternative? And the people that give the alternative just happen to be the secular world that's out there and the government's out there. Try to get a, something's established in the church of Jesus Christ where people actually have to give up money. They actually have to give up time. We actually have to build a house. We actually have to take care of these young ladies. We actually have to help them have their babies. We actually have to help them get a career. We actually have to help them raise those babies. If we did that as a church, I think that our voice would be much stronger. There's no metal behind our voice, and that's the challenge. Because today, whenever you come into the church and look at issues like this, which God would want us to shed light, it wasn't just talking about individually. He's looking at the church. And he's saying that the church should have these things. The church used to do this. We have passed them all over to the government. And as we did that, we've grown larger and we have larger budgets. But at the same time, we spend more money on buildings. But we don't do anything with them that we really ought to. Because people have gotten quite disengaged. So I think that if we had something behind what we said hey, before you think about going through an abortion, I counsel with Christian ladies on a regular basis who have had abortions. They come into my office, and they talk to me about it. And I usually try to catch, I hope I can catch them before then and let them know there are opportunities. There are places we can go. There is help that we can get you to. But then it's like, is it in this church? Well, no, not yet. Now, we're working on it. We are working on it. And there are some people among us that are working on that, and hopefully we will have that coming up pretty soon. But apart from having an answer than just you shouldn't, I think that it's fruitless what we're trying to accomplish. And putting us out on a, a road and hold a sign, abortion is murder and y'all are a bunch of killers, is probably not going to draw them to a place. Now, if you put a sign out there, dial you know, 1-800 Northside Church and we'll help you, that would probably be a greater deterrent and a, and a sense of grace that is being offered out there. So I think in all of these situations, I tried to share it this morning from the legal standpoints that you guys have got. God would expect you to follow legalities that are in a nation, but at the same time, God retains all judgment to himself. God retains all the issues to himself. And whenever he chooses to establish grace, the lady that was caught in adultery, he didn't charge her. He could have. He could have sent her to be killed. The guys were right there to do it. He chose not to because he retains the right and the authority to do that. And I think that we're supposed to walk in a, in a measure of grace, and we'll leave the other things to the authorities that are out there. But for us, I think the church has to give much, much more attention and much more time to ask ourselves, what is it that this local body has the opportunity to do? And if this local body is not the one that is specifically gifted and prepared to do something like that. There are other churches in the area that are, and maybe Northside could contribute some of the funding to fund a fully funded program in another sister church that is not us that might help some of these ladies out, and we could point them that way. But sometimes we become so loyal to our own church that we've lost sight of the church. And I think that can be a real challenge. So I think whenever you're talking to a young lady that might be contemplating an abortion, uh, there's a reason that she is, and it is not because she wants to get rid of her child. There's something deeper than that. And I would at, at most uh, right now or at best right now try to figure out, is there anything that we could do to help? Is there any person I could let you talk to before you pursue that that might be able to help you see that there are some other avenues? The choice is ultimately theirs. But I think that we have to be a much more open community to try to help out, and we need to be a much more involved church and to say, we're going to try to help out with some of these things. It costs money. you got to build buildings. you got to have that kind of, that's a reality. And that, 
Have you, have you listened to some of the preachers and teachers that are on the television networks and things like that? You're never supposed to tithe. God didn't tell us to tithe. You're not supposed to give your money to the church. You're not supposed to do that. I hear that all the time. It's like, well, how, how, do, you, how do you fund any of this stuff? And it's not free. It's just not free. And I would love to see. I th- we're, we're getting ready to, we, Northside, uh, have some people on, on staff, not on staff. We have some people in our church who were very convicted and uh, about abortion and wanted to find a way that we could help out. And so they have connected with Port City Community Church, who has a program over there. I wish I could call it out right now. Somebody can call it out for me. What is it? Embrace Grace. Embrace Grace. And uh, Port City has been doing that for quite some time. They're very, very good at it. Some people in our church want to take a part in that. And so Port City asked us this. They said, hey, how about this? Don't, don't, don't start that on your own. We wish that there would have been a church that would have helped us to understand, and we could avoid many of the hardships. So will you let us teach you, and then you can come over and start it at Northside? I think it's pretty close to being started, and then we will actually have something here that we could offer to somebody that's in that situation. The end result would be that we would throw showers for these ladies, Here's what happens. Here's where the Christian community falters. You're going to throw a shower for an unwed mother that's out there sleeping around that is, is violating the Word of God? Yeah. We are. Yes, we are. That, that's, that's what we do. We're, we're not promoting what they did. We're not affirming what they did. We're showing them a way out. So we want to help to provide for their child. We want to help them walk through that process. We want to help them prepare for what they're going to need to take care of that child. And we're, we hopefully we'll save some lives and hopefully we'll save some women. But it requires the Christian community to get real. We live in a sinful world. And if you're expecting perfection before we're going to help somebody, we're going to help nobody. So we have to reach out in some areas like that. And it's, 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 tragedy. it's a tragedy that we see abortion that's happened Roe v. Wade, um, you know, I'm grateful for that overturning. I'm not happy that there's not the same effort given to say, well, how do we help them now? Because there's going to be even more. And the last thing we want to see is uh, what used to be uh, these dangerous abortions and things like that that puts at risk everybody's life. Uh, is there a better way? And what we did was just chop it off, but we didn't have to offer any, well, like we didn't say, well, let's turn a whole bunch of money over to helping some of these ladies and some other programs. And I think it needs to go deeper than that, relationships and so forth that are there. It's a pretty big problem. But hopefully the church could get involved and they would put muscle behind what we're saying instead of judgment. Incidentally, the Lord continues to bless and embrace grace that Northside should, is on track to launch in the fall. I knew it was coming. I just know when. Terry, did you have a question? Uh, I might have changed my mind. Well, I have a comment. Am I allowed to make a comment? Yeah. Yeah, you guys, you guys speak in the speaker to microphone. <laughs> okay, so between Alejandra and Lori's question, so um, I had 20 years of service at OBGYN, Lori, and um, there are so many people literally out of 100% of people that have abortions, 97% of them do not want to do it, and they're all like, my parents, my grandparents, and my church will disown me. And I have seen my personal self. People in a church go so hard. Oh, no, 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 but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying, what can we do is, right, and I know you do, is that, you know, you have to watch what you say because they feel like there is no other out. Now, what they don't get explained about is what happens after you do that when they get all of these feelings they never expected. And so I think that, um, you know, as a Christian, let's ask ourselves, okay, if that were me, what would I say to someone that might help them change their mind? So you're not out to change their mind, but, you're, but, but most of them have zero hope. And so where you or giving them just a smidgen, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of times that will change their mind. We had an ultrasound tech 
that literally showed people their baby and it changed their mind immediately. And so, because it was the reality of, okay, this is life, where you have your special needs child, you know, people are scared. They're, they're like, oh my God, what can I do? You know, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. My life is ruined. And that might be where you may not be able to do a crowd like this, but you could come up beside one-on-one -on -one with that person and say, hey, you know what? There are going to be challenges, but this is how you get to them. And see, you're going to be able to minister to people that I can't because I don't know that. And so I think by what you're saying, you know, something like the Embrace Grace is going to Embrace Grace is going to be similar to that, where you have opportunity to put your skills over onto help someone else with what you've already been helped with. You know what I'm saying? So you're sort of giving them a leg up. So, okay. And so then for Alejandra, before you go back over here, um, you know, some people just claim offensiveness because they're convicted. You know, and I'll never forget when we were in seminary, we were at a church. And we went to a new Sunday school class, and the, the guy that was teaching the class was talking about being offended by someone sharing the gospel to him. And so, um, you know, the long story short, because he told the whole thing, was that he was that person. And he was just thanking the guy that had offended him into heaven. So your personality, I know, and so you're not ever going to step over that line but if you are truly straight up gospel, you know, when you talk to them in the loving way that I know that you already do, then you're going to have them to think about that when you walk away, where if somebody's browbeating them, they're not going to think about them ever again. So I think you just keep on doing what you're doing. <laughs> okay, we got, uh, we're going to take two more questions. Okay. trying to condemn people it was more like hypothetical just discussion with people I've actually like talked to some people that were considering abortions before and some of them have gone on to like have their children oh we it didn't was, take it, it that was more yeah, just we didn't like take it that way. random conversation where people are already kind of coming at it defensive like you can't tell me what to do with my my body and things like well that. I think in all like things that we have, the, the church has to have something <laughs> yeah. uh, that puts iron behind what we say uh, we didn't take it that you were trying to offend somebody. I know you're trying to help them. Anybody that knows you knows better than that. Roscoe. Yeah, uh, the church and state biblical role of believers in secular government, and then next week the woke world. My question is, how can we make an influence on our electoral process? How are we going to know who's a dirt bag and who's not? I mean, you know, let's, let's put it over plain language here. Some of our people in our government right now are dirtbags. Well, let's, let's, um, let's be a bit more kind. Th that was being kind. <laughs> no, that's, that's um, uh, I know that you can somebody, feel that I'm way. I'm sorry that, about but that. But what, no, what I'm saying, Roscoe, is that if we're really going to be effective, we can't be offensive like that. Yeah. There are policies that we don't agree with, yes. and there are things that we wish they did not do. You have to do your homework. You have to take a look at them. You have to study you have to look at their voting record. You've got to find out what they do. And there are plenty of places out there where we can find that there are people among us in our church right now that have that kind of information that you can look at. And then we make a conscious and a, a, a reasonable choice on our basic faith to do that. But if we, if, we say that, if we say it in a derogatory way, then it just it becomes political all over again, and it sounds like a fight. And we don't want to do that. We, we want to make sure that we're saying we want good people to lead us. We want them to follow good policy. We're prayerfully hoping they're going to be Christian in the way that they do it. But even if they're not Christian, can I tell you that God used so many lost people to carry out His will? Uh, King Cyrus, King Artaxerxes, Nebuchadnezzar, God used all of those people. So uh, once again, let's elevate God above all of those people, but let's make a good choice as well. But you're going to have to study. You're going to have to look them up. I'm not very political correct when I come to talking, but when I see someone that goes in the office and and they're relatively, you know, moderately wealthy, and then they come out of office with a hundred million dollars, I'm like, what happened? Where did they get that from? It was all about the power. It was all about the money. It weren't about the people. Well, one of the reasons, but but see, we're making assumptions. 
And one of the things you have to re be reminded of is the reason that God does not allow us to judge another person is because we don't know all the information. We are making assumptions. We're filling in the gaps that are not, uh, that we don't know. And that would be in, an impropriety before the Lord as a believer. We're not allowed to do that. And we don't want to do that. We want to take and say, here's something that we want. Uh, whenever this is what we want, in order for that to be fulfilled, we need this kind of a person. And so we're going to vet out the persons, the people that we want. We're going to vote for them. We, it's a Democratic vote for the person. And then they're a, a Republican representative. Um, and if they don't turn out well, we did the best that we could do. And now we want to hold them accountable. You go up to Washington. You can do your lobbying. You can write letters. You can do those kind of things. You have to stay involved and engaged. Because if you don't, then what would make them think that anything is wrong? Uh, but you have to go, and I think that, that honor, the Bible talks about honor. Is, you need to give honor to those that honor is due. And a person puts himself in a public situation. They deserve honor. Even if you don't agree with them, they still deserve honor. And when you, there's, there's, um, there are clear biblical principles that say, if I honor this person, this person will in turn return honor to me. If I disrespect this person, I would expect them to return disrespect to me, and they're not going to be very moldable or makeable. So we have to be really careful, and I think that's where the Christian community can step up to a higher plane. Uh, we can step up to a higher level and be the more mature, is what I'm hoping that we would choose to do to was, get better leadership. Was your question, where do you find that information? Yes, I mean, uh, they, it they, says bring to light everything. Yeah, well, keep, and Pastor, if they've got stuff in the dark that you can't see, that you can't right. find out about. Well, that you you have to do your homework. There's guys that come out every year that gives you that information. But the bottom line is, as a Christian community, I think we have given up because I hear it all the time. Does my vote really count? Yes. It does count. And so many people will not vote because they feel like it's not going to make a difference. And when they don't vote, then it doesn't make a difference. So you, you can't just give up. We have, again, huh? <laughs> yeah, it goes the opposite way. And then we complain about it. Don't complain about it if you didn't take the initiative to vote. I think John shared with me, we had a voter registration out here this morning and um, evidently, everybody in our church is registered to vote, so thank y'all for, for being registered to vote. Uh, not quite everybody. But he, he shared an astounding number of, of evangelicals that like 60-plus percent are not even registered to vote, and then we think we can make a difference. So we want you to register. We want you to do your homework. We want you to vote, as Joe said, from a scriptural basis. Not, not from w whether you like the person or whether you don't like the person because there's no one in here that at any given time that we can have a, a moment of weakness and do things that we normally wouldn't do. So you can't base it all on that, on that person. But you need to vote your convictions. But you need to vote if you want to make a difference. And as Lindy said, you, you need to get involved. You know, you need to put your... your shoe leather to the, the pavement and, and go out there and, and get involved if God's leading you to do that. One more quick question. Or not. I think Delaney's in pursuit. I just wanted to take, take the chance to plug since you were talking about Embrace Grace so much. So Kim and I, Kim Balsiger and I are starting Embrace Grace in September. So since we've been talking about it, the number one way you could help support is we just want there to be a community where these women feel like they can come to this church and be welcome. Because it's a class, yes, but we're hoping to plug them into the church. So um, anyways, information will be out soon, but I just wanted to say thank you for talking about Embrace Grace because we really hope that this will be a place that these women will feel welcome and that they'll be able to bring their babies here and they'll be able to grow up in the Lord and that they'll be able to come to know the Lord themselves and their kids too. So anyways, thank you for your support in advance. And we just are really, really excited about these ladies that we can help hopefully soon. Amen. Guys, we're going to close up shop here. Um, I'm going to ask the pastor to pray. Before he does, I'm going to leave one last final word for you. In uh, Jeremiah 29, 
the, the Israelites were about to go into captivity, uh, and they were, they were going to be in a hostile nation that was completely antithetical to anything godly, and uh, there was nothing that they could do about it. And one of Jeremiah's uh, comments or, or, or counsel to them is found in Jeremiah 29, and uh, starting in verse 4, says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. And these are the people who are captive. This is what he says. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. In other words... Live. Live and enjoy life and continue to be fruitful and multiply because every time we are fruitful and multiply, we are, uh, we are increasing the image of God in a hostile world. Then he goes on and says this, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to it, pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. Whether you feel like our per current politicians are the Babylonian dictators or they are the blessings from God, you need to pray for them. You need to pray for our government. Because when you pray for them then you, and you're praying for their peace, then you're getting peace yourself. That's the Word of God. It will encourage you. If nothing else, pray for your government, your governing officials, whether you like them or not, whether they know Jesus or not. Pray that they do know Jesus. But if we, by praying for them, we are actually um, uh, encouraging the Lord to provide peace for them and by, uh, by effect on ourselves as well. So let me leave you with that piece of encouragement. Join me in prayer. Father, again, we want to thank you for our nation. And I want to thank you for the privilege of involvement in our nation. We have a system of government here that is really second to none in the world. Uh, even in that, we understand that there are clear usurpations of authority in many places. There are some violations. There are some twistedness. There's a, that's because it is operated by human beings, and we should expect that that is in there. And we have clearly seen a digression in our nation away from you and a progression away from you, and yet at the same time, uh, that could be halted uh, relatively quickly if as, Christian, as a Christian community, our number one responsibility and in in what everybody can do is to vote. And if we did, uh, there would probably never be another candidate that wasn't a believer that would make it into office if all of the Christian community voted. That's uh, clearly a dream, and we're not seeing that happen. And so we have to be very uh, careful, and we have to be very strategic with our voting, and I hope that we will. I hope you also help us to understand, Father, that regardless of what the government is and regardless of what's going on, uh, I really want you among us. We want your presence. You established a government in Israel so that you could be in the land and they could commune with you in that land. You sacrificed your son so that you could be among us and that we could be among you, that you would be our God and we would be your people. And so, Father, help us to recognize that we have huge responsibility within a, a community, just as a citizen of the United States, uh, that we have a responsibility and a privilege to be involved and engaged in our governmental process. And we need many, many more believers to be in there that would, for the good of the nation, not, not to fight a battle over somebody or to win, but for the good of the nation and the good of the people. Help us also to understand, Father, that regardless of how this nation goes, you are in charge of all things and we can trust you and that we will be okay. It may be a hardship, but we have a generation coming behind us that needs to see not our depression, not our uh, giving up, not our just complete uh, throwing our hands up in the air, but to see us work through difficult challenges, work the problems that we have. And I really think that, that some of us need to step up to the plate and step into public, the public arena. We need to step into public offices. We need to open ourselves up to be political uh, opponents or, or people that would, go, would engage. And as we do that, and then we, they see a difference in us. We're not there to be argumentative. We're there to be involved in governance and we're to help and so father as as in the days of abraham whenever he was going into the city of sodom to try to rescue his nephew lot and you said that you would have spared that city all the way down from 50 people all the way down to 10 that you would have spared the city if you would have found 10 righteous men 
And apparently uh, there was not. But in this country and even in this sanctuary tonight, if you would cut the same deal, if we could say it that way with us, there are clearly 10 people in here tonight that are concerned, that would do something. And if that's true, Father, what you've done, then I ask you to spare our nation. I ask you, Father, to place your hand on us, to place your hand on our president. He is a very sick man. Uh, unfortunately, even it seems like that the people that are around him are not overly concerned with him too much as a human being and as an individual. He seems to be being used in a lot of ways, but he's clearly sick. He clearly has some issues going on in a mental capacity, whether it's Alzheimer's or something like that. And so I pray for his health, Father. I pray that you'll help him for his entire cabinet, uh, that you would enlighten yourself to them, make yourself known to them, that would cause them to recognize who you are and to follow you, even as Nebuchadnezzar did whenever he saw the three Hebrew boys in the fire. And so, Father, for, for those that, things that we don't like, uh, we petition you to engage us and engage your Holy Spirit in the life of all these people. Pray that you'll bless those who have come here tonight, given their time, help them to redeem their time. And as we re-engage again next week, I pray that we'll be able to give light also again in another area of wokeness that can be a very controversial issue. But I pray always that we recognize that a soft answer turns away wrath and wisdom is what we are supposed to carry and we can provide it to somebody. And whenever we do, we increase the peace of the land. Help us to always be good representatives of who you are. And what always amazed me was the religious people, the Pharisees and Sadducees were some of the most hated people there in Rome. But whenever you, our Father and your Son, Jesus Christ, God himself in the flesh, the ultimate judge of the world, stepped foot on this planet, people, sinners, flocked to him. I think if we're to ask any questions about ourselves, we might want to ask because Jesus was righteous. And so righteousness doesn't turn people away. If it did, nobody would have ever come to Jesus. So it's not our righteousness that turns them away. It could be our self-righteousness. But Father, they flocked to Jesus. I think we need to ask ourselves, why are they not flocking to us? And look individually in our own heart and realize, could we do better? And I pray that we can in every single area, every issue that's out there. I pray that you'll help us find pathways to help somebody find hope for the future. We thank you now. I ask you to bless us as we leave in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Love you all.